Beckham. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I've subtitled this talk My Personal Journey uh, because I lay no claims to being an expert on uh, the technologies or the, the pedagogies uh, of blended learning. Um, I was probably nearly the last person among my acquaintances to get a smartphone. And when it started to get embarrassing and socially awkward, uh, then I uh, adapted. So, uh, as I say, I, I make no claims to be any kind of technological expert or technological uh, early adapter. So, what I'm going to talk about today is very much at the, the personal experiential level, my own journey of transforming uh, one of my courses, Social and Cultural Change, uh, what I did, uh, my experience of it, the students' experience, uh, and the, the lessons I learned. Yeah. Okay, I might have to. So what I'm going to cover is, first of all, briefly talk about some of the characteristics of the course that shaped the, the way in which I blended it. Uh, secondly, talk about the process of course transformation and delivery. Uh, and then I'm going to talk about my own experience, the, the lessons that I learned uh, from doing this. I'm going to talk about the students' experience, and I'm going to share some of the results of a survey I did with the students at the end of the module. Uh, and finally, the conclusions that I took from this, my own learning process, and the revisions and changes I'll be making in the blended course this semester. Okay, so to give a little bit of background to the course, it's sociology. Uh, it's SOC 201, Social and Cultural Change. Uh, it's an obligatory module within the sociology major. And it's usually taken directly after introductory sociology. So most students, they'll do the 101, Introduction to so Sociology. And then of the 200 courses, this one is usually the next one they do. So in other words, it's a fairly basic uh, course, it's a general introduction to the topic of social change. And the way it usually works is I begin by uh, talking about change in concrete areas uh, of people's lives, areas like the family, education, new media, uh, the workplace and so on, and work up to the more abstract dimensions of different sociological concepts and sociological theories of change. So it's a, a fairly early level course. That obviously reflects uh, the way in which I blended it. Uh, and furthermore, uh, it's quite discursive. So you know, there isn't a, sing a, a particular practical skill or uh, equation or something that I'm, you know, students are taking out at the end of each session. It's quite a discursive course. There's a lot, a lot of talking, a lot of talking from me, and hopefully a, a certain amount of talking between the students uh, and from them back to me. Again, that shaped, as you'll see, hopefully how I blended it. Um, the sections can vary in size quite widely. There's usually two sections, uh, and depending on the time they're taught and so on, you might have a small section of 20 students or less. You can have sections of up to 80 students. Again, that shapes, in terms of designing the course, the level of interaction you can expect with each individual student, the level of attention uh, that you can give them. Uh, it's all female students. Uh, and I'd taught the course for two semesters before I started blending it uh, at the, the start of, uh, or at the, the, the start of summer uh, 2018. Okay, so the course transformation process. The first thing was designing the blend itself. And initially I uh, decided on blending uh, 10 classes, or putting 10 classes online, eventually, because it seemed to be going quite well, I increased that to 12. So 37% of the course uh, was delivered through online methods, the rest through the traditional face-to-face -face class. Uh, and I suppose I wanted, on the one hand, to have a good section of it online, but I didn't want to go beyond that because, as a, a fairly early course within students' experience of sociology, I wanted them to have a certain amount of face time with myself as the, the lecturer, you know, to get to know me, to be able to come to me if they had any problems, uh, and so forth. Uh, the first thing that I did was I developed a standardised lesson plan uh, in May of 2018 uh, for each of the, which was going to be applied to each of the classes that I deliver online. Uh, and I worked with Tendai Charles uh, in the Centre for Excellence uh, in Teaching and Learning to develop that. And I'll show you a sample 
uh, of that in a minute. So every one of the, the online classes was going to follow a standard format. That made it easier for me to create them. It also made it easier for the students because they knew exactly what it was expected of them in every single online class. And I was able to walk them through the format and explain that in the introductory lecture to the course. What was that format? Uh, first of all, they were given an assigned reading uh, from the textbook uh, at the start uh, to prepare themselves for each class. Uh, there were three brief videos as part of each online session. Uh, I did those on screencast automatic because it was a simple, accessible uh, technology to use when I, I had a, a significant number of lessons to blend. Those three videos, usually one would be quite short, maybe five to eight minutes of an introduction to the class. And further on, there'd be two more substantive instructional videos of up to 15 minutes in duration. There was also two collaborative exercises as part of each online class. Uh, I created those uh, on Google Docs. Uh, why? Again, it was what I found easiest. I'd used Google Docs before, I was familiar with it, so I used the tool that was there to hand. Uh, and uh, ideally, the, the students were to do those exercises after the first video and after the second video as they worked through uh, the online class. Uh, and then finally, there was a quiz on Blackboard in each session that was sim very simple, five multiple choice questions just to test had they watched the videos. Uh, and it gave a, a means of testing attendance uh, as well. So uh, I gave them 2% of uh, their overall grade uh, in terms of marks for the collaborative exercises in each class, 1% for uh, the uh, the online quiz. So overall, across 12 classes, 36% of the marks for the course were going to be for the online work. And that, was, again, was explained to them very clearly in the introductory lecture to the module. So they knew every week that they logged on, that they did their online session, they were going to accumulate marks for it, and that it was important to, to keep up with that. So the materials, uh, then, having done the, the planning, having you know, passed the, the lesson plans with the Centre for Excellence in Teaching and Learning. Uh, at the end of summer 2018, I did the materials development, or the bulk of the materials development. I just blocked out 10 days just before the start of the fall teaching, and basically gave those over almost entirely uh, to doing the first 10 sessions. Uh, and then I, I did two further sessions uh, uh, later on during the semester. Um, the blended course was then taught for the first time in the fall semester uh, of 2018, uh, so last semester. Uh, and the, the only other thing I'd say here as well, in terms of how I implemented it, I gave the students a three-day window to complete each online session. So let's say that they were due a face-to-face -face class on Tuesday at 11 o'clock, uh, and I'd replaced that with a, an online session. At 8 o'clock Tuesday morning, uh, the videos, the quiz, the, the exercises would be available to them online, and they then had until, let's say, 5 o'clock on Thursday to complete the, the group exercises, to do the quiz, and of course to watch the videos as part of that. At the end of that time, the quiz automatically went offline, and I would correct the, the Google Doc exercises so that I knew who'd done them and who hadn't. So that gave the students a flexibility with this course. Uh, which, as you'll see in a while, was one of the big positives uh, that came back from them. So that, in outline, is, is the, the process of blending that I went through. Um, just to give you a few examples of the, the different aspects, uh, this is a sample of one of the lesson plans. So uh, as I say, I had a standard format that I applied to every single lesson that I blended. So this gives you the format. The particular lesson was on urbanisation, but you can see uh, they're set a reading to do before they begin the class. They then have an introductory video, which in this case outlines the concept of urbanisation, uh, looked at some patterns and causes, so very general material. The students were then asked in the collaborative group exercise to try and apply that to society here in UAE. So the idea was to develop critical thinking in a group. 
Uh, I'll let you know later on how that went. Uh, but that was the idea. So rather than just repeating material from the video, they were to work in group to discuss the causes of urbanisation uh, in the United Arab Emirates, whereas the, the video had been a general uh, discussion. Uh, again, you had a second video then, which was a bit longer, 15 minutes, focused on one particular uh, social theorist uh, whose work uh, is on urbanisation. Uh, and then again, the students were to come together and critically think themselves, you know, what are the changes in social relationships and cultural values that urbanisation brings about? Uh, then you had a second, or sorry, a third uh, video, again slightly longer one, uh, focusing on a particular theorist, uh, and then the, the quiz at the end. So this was the, the standard format. Um, the, the sample exercises, now these would have been up on Google Docs, and they would have I, I created a form for the students to fill in you know, with the different points. Uh, but I suppose the key idea here, the, the questions were designed to get the students applying sociological concepts to their own life and the world around them, thinking critically as a group. Uh, now, I might just show one of the, I, I won't, what I'll do before I show the video, um, I start talking about the experience of actually creating this. Um, Okay, so my experience of, of this, I said now what I did, how did I actually find it? So first of all, in terms of the course development, the content creation, that was quite straightforward. Uh, I have to say I got amazing help from CTL, uh, Tendai Charles in particular was absolutely amazing in terms of walking me through this process, uh, helping me at every stage from the developing the lesson plans to being there right through until the, the, the end of the semester. Uh, when the whole course had been delivered. So with that help and the, the training sessions I'd been to the previous semester uh, when I first applied to blend the course, you know, there was a huge amount of support there and it made the, the creation of the course reasonably straightforward. Now one thing I found was that as well as changing the delivery method of the course by moving materials online, the content then had to evolve a bit as well. Uh, and I taught, as I said at the start, I taught this course for two semesters before I blended it. So I kind of felt, you know, my PowerPoints are fairly developed, my materials are fairly developed here. Uh, and what I found was when I started to translate my face-to-face -face class materials into the videos, uh, a number of things happened. First of all, I found the delivery in the video format a lot more concise than face-to-face. And partly that's, I imagine, because you, you know, you're not fielding questions from students in the middle of it or having discussions. Partly because it just seems to be a more concise format. You're less discursive. If you give four examples of something talking in class, you seem to give one in a video. Uh, because, of course, the students can rewind it and, uh, and watch it again. So it's a more concise format. So the material that you have for a class will kind of boil down into its essence when you move to put it into video. Uh, secondly, I found myself restructuring uh, my PowerPoints to make them a lot more visual. So if I had a slide uh, originally with, say, six bullet points, I ended up a lot of the time maybe creating six slides for the videos with one bullet point and an image each. Because uh, when, I, when you're talking over something, I didn't want uh, the, the slide just sitting there on the, the student's screens without any movement, without anything happening. Uh, so, uh, as I say, I, I rest ended up restructuring a lot of the material to make it more visual and to keep the slides moving uh, on the screen. Uh, and finally, I ended up restructuring the content uh, of each lecture uh, to make it, uh, to, cre uh, to create you know, coherent videos. So I started off with materials for you know, a, an hour and 15 minute lecture, which hopefully was relatively coherent and held together. But that didn't naturally just automatically break into three. So I had to pull out certain sections and maybe expand some material, cut out other material, that I had three videos that each in themselves was relatively coherent with a beginning, a middle, and an end, and some kind of takeaway at the end for the students. So for example, if I had originally covered maybe three different theorists in a lecture, a lot of the time I found I was dropping to two, 
because I had a short introductory video, which was quite general, and then I'd create two 10 to 15 minute videos, each focusing on the ideas of one theorist, so that there was a, a, a coherent core to them. So, to be honest, in terms of my experience of creating the course, the biggest amount of time, even though I taught this for two semesters already, the biggest amount of time went on restructuring my own material, recreating the PowerPoints, uh, and the amount of time then actually recording each of those as a video on screencast of matic was considerably shorter. So that, that surprised me. That was one of the things that I wasn't really expecting. Um, now, I can give a brief glance at the videos if people are interested. Um, SOC 201, Social and Cultural Change. Lecture 19, Patterns of Change, Organization. In this video, we'll explore how cities change the kinds of social relationships and cultural values that people have. In particular, we'll focus on the work of Louis Wirth and his classic essay, Urbanism as a Way of Life. In Urbanism as a Way of Life, Louis Wirth started by looking at three characteristics of the population of cities, which he felt had a decisive influence on people's social relationships, values, and attitudes. The population of cities, he said, is large, dense, and diverse. The huge size of urban populations mean that it takes our money and passes it. They may also meet people through common interests, such as in sport, or music, and so on, by their ability to afford accommodation, whether it's purchasing a house or renting an apartment. The stratification of house prices, naturally, in the city where these informal social controls don't exist. Okay, so you can see it's quite straightforward. It's uh, me talking across uh, a PowerPoint. Uh, and you know, there's no bells and whistles. And I know, you know some people can create you know, much more sophisticated videos, but with the, the amount of material that I wanted to blend, that seems the most straightforward way to do it. Uh, I also wanted the students still have to have access to the PowerPoint, because I know a lot of them, you know, th their means of study is they, they print off the PowerPoints before the class, even in the face-to-face -face classes, and then they, they write notes on it as I'm talking. So I wanted to keep the PowerPoint format uh, rather than <coughs> using something like GoAnimate. Uh, or, or another tool. So quite straightforward, but the, the main uh, accent was in trying to make them as visual as possible, spacing out uh, the, the material within them. Okay, so that was what I did. Uh, how did it work out then uh, in practice? Okay, so as I say, I found the, uh, the, the course preparation quite straightforward, but a lot of that was down to the help that I received uh, here from the university. Uh, in terms of the rollout, again, largely unproblematic. In the introductory class to the course for each section, I outlined what blended learning was, how I planned to implement it, what each online class would uh, consist of, and you know, the students, there was no confusion, uh, there was nobody emailing me in panic uh, afterwards saying, what's all this about? Uh, there was nobody turning up at, at lectures expecting uh, me to be there when it was actually online. Uh, after the first week of the semester, the second class of every week was online. So the first was the traditional face-to-face, -face, and then we'd have the online as the second in the week. So they were still seeing me every week in class. Uh, the students were positive from the very start about the blended learning. They were comfortable with the technology. There was no problems uh, there. Uh, the only area where there was a little bit of teething problems with, with the Google Docs. Uh, a lot of the students didn't have Gmail accounts and getting them to set them up, and that was a, a bit of a, a job. In terms of my own experience, the, the biggest benefit for me was enhanced flexibility. I had to put in a lot of work at the start, but once that was done, I then had flexibility to create you know, greater blocks of time for my own research and so on during the semester itself. Uh, and again, conferences. I uh, had to go to a conference in early November. It actually happened that the last day of the conference was falling on the day that should have been one of the face-to-face -face classes, 
but I was able to just swap around the blended and the face-to-face, -face, give that later in the week, uh, and so uh, you know, go to the conference. So flexibility, the, the main benefit, I would say, for myself. A um, couple of things that, that came up over the course of the semester. One thing was the students were looking for the PowerPoints to the videos. So I'd uploaded all the videos on Blackboard, but they were looking for the PowerPoints as well because they wanted to print them off as a revision tool. Uh, and even to take notes uh, as I was talking on the videos uh, on the PowerPoints to, to supplement uh, the, the notes in those. Another thing I noticed compared to previous semesters, which I hadn't expected, was that student contact outside of class seemed to shift online as well. So, for example, there was less students coming into my office, but there seemed to be more emails. Uh, I had always, in the, the previous semesters, the main assignment uh, in this course, which was a, an annotated bibliography, uh, I had made the offer to students that before they submitted it, they could come in and I'd give them feedback and they could revise it. I found this year nearly the majority of them were emailing it as opposed to coming into my office hours. I don't know why that was, uh, whether it was just coincidence, or was it that the, the blended course students were coming into the university a bit less, it suited them maybe more rather than coming physically into the office to email. But that, that was one change uh, I saw. Uh, the one area where there was a number of issues was with the group work. So from the start, there was a number of students complaining that you know, there was four girls in a group, two of them were doing all the work, could they change to another group, this kind of stuff. Um, more fundamentally, uh, and this came up in class as well as in person, uh, the requirement for critical thinking and applying concepts to social life, uh, that scared the life out of a lot of the students. They actually were terrified. Uh, and you know, in a class discussion of this, you know, one of the students said, you know, Doctor, we can't find the answers on Google. Uh, so what they very much wanted was the video would give the answer to the questions in the group work. Or else you could just Google it and you'd have a straightforward answer. And this critical thinking thing, uh, it, it scared them. It made them nervous. Um, and the, the other thing was that I ended up with something like 10 or 11 groups between the two sections I was teaching. Uh, and there was two exercises every week, week for every group. So when you add that up, it was a, f a fair amount of corrections. So I'd created a stick to beat my own back with this, to be honest. Uh, and the, the number of exercises to correct as well, uh, particularly online, meant that the, the quality of feedback I could give the students wasn't as high as I would have liked. So that, there was a number of experiences of problems there from both my perspective and from the students' perspective. Now, the student experience of all this. Uh, so I did a, an online survey with the, the two sections that I had at the end of the module. Because uh, for my own you know, interest in terms of developing this course going forward, there was particular questions that, that I wanted to ask. Uh, and 37 out of the 40 students in the two sections uh, responded. So uh, I'll just pick out some of the, the questions I think are most significant, or responses that are most significant there. So first of all, compared to a traditional course, how would you rate your experience uh, of blended learning uh, in this course? And as you can see, nearly all students found it either significantly better or better. There was only one student that was highly critical and felt it was worse. Um, secondly, how, how do you feel the online tools helped you to learn compared to a traditional class? Again, you can see most people were, were very positive uh, about that. What, in your opinion, are the advantages of a blended course. The biggest advantage from the, the student's perspective, you can see, is flexibility in their schedule. Uh, and the, the fact I had given them a three-day window to complete the exercises and the classes, I think, fed into that answer. I think if they had been expected to do the, the blended coursework in the, the same hour and a quarter as they would have done their traditional class, they might have been less happy. But it gave them a flexibility. It gave them a, a freedom which they, they really liked. Um, again, a lot of them say the technology helps them to learn better. Uh, and the third most common answer was that they could pause or review the online videos. And that again was something verbally 
uh, that a lot of students said to me. Uh, and I suppose, you know, uh, I've not just a, an Irish accent, but I have a, an accent from a very particular part of Ireland called Cork. So uh, it's not an accent you usually see in the movies or the, the news or, or anything else. So I suppose for the students, they had the opportunity, they did, rather than just listening to me once off in class and trying to take notes, they could pause and they could slow down and they could check anything they weren't very sure of. Uh, only one person ticked this box, other please specify, and again, there was obviously one student didn't like this at all because they said uh, there's no benefits, so, or there's no advantages. But most people positive. Okay, so then there was an open question. Are there any disadvantages to the blended course? So I've just selected a few of the answers here. The most common one was no. They didn't see anything that was disadvantageous compared to traditional learning. Um, a few other comments, sometimes the video sound isn't clear, uh, some things need to be explained more, and then the group work. Not all members of the group help us, the girls don't cooperate with group work, so that, that's the, the big uh, negative. Um, then please rate your satisfaction with each of the following aspects of the course on a scale of 1 to 10. And 10 was the highest satisfaction. Uh, and so here's the satisfaction with each of the, the different tools. So um, what I have here is I, I've counted up the, the respondents who expressed a satisfaction level of, of 8, 9, or 10. So who are really, really satisfied with each tool. And the one they loved the most was the online quizzes. None of you, I'm sure, would be surprised by that. Students love quizzes. And they're used to quizzes. Um, uh, they always want more quizzes. They don't want essay questions, they want quizzes. Um, the second, which interested, this is interesting because you saw some of the comments to the open question earlier where students are giving out about girls not, not cooperating in group work. But the second uh, most you know, satisfactory aspect of the course according to this question was the online group exercises. Uh, just ahead of the online videos, uh, and then the face-to-face -face classes is what they're least satisfied with. Okay, so uh, they had to come in here, I, I think. Um, so that was satisfaction with individual aspects of the course. Now another question was about the videos. And again, this is an open question. How could I have improved uh, the videos? And I, just a selection of responses. Uh, not having a long video, shortcut the video, don't make it long. Uh, so, you know, I think that the results coming out of this is switch everything online but don't have any videos or beyond three minutes. Uh, write every explain the speaker said. So obviously maybe they found the language hard to follow and they, they'd have liked to have it written out. Including an online exercise or game, again, you know, things I'm bearing in mind for next year. Uh, and write the speaker explain again in the slides. So there, there are some useful things there, I felt, in, in terms of how the, the videos could be improved for the future. So uh, again, because I got this negative feedback during the semester about the group exercises, I put in this specific question. Uh, in general, do you like or dislike group uh, assignments like those used in this course as a learning and assessment method? And you can see it's overwhelmingly positive. Most students like them a great deal, others like them moderately, and it's only a couple of students are saying they dislike them. So ambiguous results around this. Uh, I asked them was there different kinds of online activities they'd like to see added in future blended courses. Relatively few students, it was an open question, relatively few students answered. Uh, Socrative was mentioned uh, as something that they'd like to see. Um, Again, I found this interesting. Uh, so, I say approximately 40% of the course material was delivered online. If you were in charge of designing the course for next year, what combination of online and face to face teaching uh, would you choose? So, you can see, uh, I think six students wanted to keep it as it is, the, the just under 40% online. Tiny number of students had cut back the online. I'd say they're the same people who maybe didn't like the exercises and you know, um, found the, the course difficult overall. Everybody else is saying, more and more online, more and more online. Um, 
Okay, another question. Because I had less students coming into my office, uh, and because I was only meeting the students face-to-face -face once a week, I was wondering, you know, will they feel they can't ask me questions, or I'm unavailable, uh, or that the, the level of interaction I is poor? Uh, so I put in this question, are you satisfied with the level of interaction between the instructor and the students? And as you can see, the, the, the main response is because it's a scale of 1 to 10, so 10 is the highest level of satisfaction. Most responses are clustered down here. There's another cluster around the middle. So overall, uh, what I take from that, students didn't feel that the shift to a blended approach uh, made, you know, uh, created large difficulties in terms of interacting with myself as the instructor. But probably you wouldn't want to be pushing the, the online portion up past 50 you know, too much. So uh, what was the thing you found least useful about this blended course? And you, again, you can see the, the thread of uh, negativity around the online group exercises. So exercise, uh, distributing the work, which I take as a reference to the groups. Again, this was an open question that relatively few students answered. Uh, but that, those were some of the responses. The last question, if there was one thing you could change to make the course better, what would it be? So, so some people thought nothing. Uh, and again, make the, the cl other classes online, have blended for the whole semester. Uh, make the slides easier, short videos, uh, and again, the group work, you know, without group work, group work. So uh, that issue is coming up uh, again. Okay, so that was the, my experience, the students' experience, weighing it up. What, what are the, the conclusions I draw at the end of the semester? Um, overall, the students' experience of the course, the feedback seems to have been very positive. Uh, from the students' perspective, the main benefits were, first of all, the flexibility. Uh, I think they liked the fact they had a three-day window uh, to, to cover the material, they didn't necessarily have to come into uh, to the buildings here, uh, to the campus uh, on those days, and, and so on. They liked the ability as well to review the videos, and they, they liked the, the, the whole online approach. There is some evidence of enhanced learning outcomes. Uh, the grades for the course were slightly up overall, and just read on the basis of reading through the answers in the final exam. Uh, you know, certainly students' comprehension of the material uh, seemed to be better than previous years. But uh, the, sociology, the Department of Sociology had changed uh, the criteria for admission to the major uh, just before I blended this course. They'd raised the GPA they were looking for from students. So is it better teaching methods or is it uh, you know, better students in terms of explaining any improvement? I don't know. Uh, but as the department blends for their courses over the next couple of years, uh, you know, hopefully we'll get more of a sense uh, of the, the relationship to uh, learning outcomes. Uh, again, uh, you can see that there's an ambiguity around the, the group work. There, there's some students really found this frustrating and difficult. Uh, there's other students in the survey in particular seems to have found it positive. Um, I think that my own take on that is First of all, I think survey bias. You know, people, even where a survey is anonymous and online, they tend to give you the, the, the response a lot of the time they think you want. So I think that there's a positivity bias. Uh, and secondly, if you had a group where there's four guards, two are doing all the work, uh, and two are still getting a grade without having to do a lot of work, well, obviously, th there's two there who are happy, and there's two who are less happy. So um, I, I think those factors uh, possibly skewed the responses around the group work. Um, certainly from my perspective, the, the group work was the, the one area of this entire experience that, that I found a little bit frustrating uh, and difficulty. Otherwise, uh, instructor experience, my own experience was extremely positive. Uh, so I mentioned the, the flexibility it, it gave me. Um, it was enjoyable. I mean, it was learning new skills. It was you know, uh, enhancing uh, the experience that way, uh, and just the variety, the fact you're not twice a week going into a class to give a traditional lecture, you're giving one traditional class, uh, and you're doing something else uh, in the other session, and you, your, your mode of interaction with the students is different. That level of inbuilt variety 
I, I found positive as well. So, I'll be continuing with this course uh, this semester, uh, and I'm going to make a number of changes based on my experience in fall 2018. So first of all, I'm going to centralize everything through Blackboard, get rid of the, the Google uh, Docs, uh, and obviously Panopto is now available through Blackboard, which I don't think it was when I started uh, preparing this course. So I'll be able to upload my existing videos onto Panopto and create new ones through Panopto. So everything will just be through Blackboard. That should streamline uh, and simplify things. I had planned the course last semester in terms of individual single class units, so class by class. And that had the unintended effect of kind of having a kind of Chinese wall between face-to-face -face teaching and learning and online teaching and learning. So what I'm going to do this semester is revise the course a little uh, to move to planning in two to three class units. So maybe take a single topic uh, in a week uh, and deal it over two class sessions, one online, one face-to-face. -face. Uh, move some more of the talk time or the, the discursive material onto online videos and move more of the group work and the discussion and the exercises into the, the actual class. So I suppose you could say something more approximating a flipped classroom uh, approach uh, because I think that will um, allow me to give more direct guidance uh, to the students in terms of doing the exercises uh, and the group work and so forth particularly when they, they seem to find the, the critical thinking aspect of things difficult. Uh, if there's new videos being created uh, as part of that, I'll take account of what the students were saying and maybe try and include more of the, the text so that, uh, you know, if they're, they're finding me talking a bit difficult to follow, they have the, the writing as well. Uh, possibly introduce some gamification, um, start experimenting with that. Uh, and for grading purposes, uh, I was going to move from the, uh, the, the group work portfolio to an individualized learning journal. So the students will still be doing exercises every week. They'll be discussing them uh, in groups in, in class, but they'll be writing them up individually uh, in, as part of a learning journal that they present at the end of the semester and are graded on. And I think the advantage of that, first of all, it takes away the unfairness of you know, maybe one student in a group of four doing a lot of work and the others freeloading uh, and getting grades. And it will also make my life easier if I'm just doing that grading at the end of the semester. And at the same time, by moving some of that work and exercises into the actual classroom, I can be there to discuss it with them, to give advice, to give them oversight. Uh, but the grading uh, moved to the end. So those are the, the, the main revisions I'm going to make in, in terms of uh, redeveloping this for the, the new year. So just to finish up, I, I'd like to thank uh, everybody in CETL for their help and support um, with the process, uh, particularly, uh, and I know he's not here, but uh, Tendai Charles was just, i say, has been amazing throughout in terms of the level of support he gave and you know, was there every single week through the whole semester. Uh, any time that I needed to talk to him or uh, look for advice or, or support in any way. So uh, that's me. Thank you for uh, listening. So uh, if there's any questions uh, on what I've covered.